Hi everyone, I would like to welcome everyone to today's webinar, 2019 Census Child Poverty Data and what COVID-19 means for kids. I'm Cara Balderi, Vice President of Family Economics at First Focus on Children, a bipartisan national children's advocacy group dedicated to making children and families a priority in federal budget and policy decisions. First Focus is also the founding member of the US Child Poverty Action Group, um, a partnership of about 20 national organizations working to end child poverty in the US. Um, and we're really thrilled to be co-hosting this webinar with the US Child Poverty Action Group, as well as the Children's Defense Fund. And I just wanna thank the staff at the Children's Defense Fund, especially Emma Mee Rabi, um, for all of your help and camaraderie in uh, putting together this webinar. Um, so last week, the US Census Bureau released annual data on child poverty, which shows that 10.5 million children, about 14%, lived in poverty in 2019, representing um, a decrease from the previous year. However, we know that this data was outdated immediately upon its release, for it does not show the devastating impact of COVID-19 on children and families. We also know that the official poverty measure and even the supplemental poverty measure continue to underestimate child poverty in the United States. And households living at twice the poverty line at about $50,000 a year for a family of four with two kids struggle to meet their basic needs. Even before the outbreak of COVID-19, child poverty was a moral crisis in the United States that affected each and every one of us. The United States continues to experience higher rates of poverty than our peer nations, and the pandemic and resulting economic recession have served to only expose and exacerbate existing racial and ethnic inequities in our society. For due to systemic racism and our lack of investment in communities of color, these crises continue to disproportionately impact Black, Latino, and American Indian children and families. Today, our presenters are going to delve further into the data on child poverty and well being that is available, including indicators that show us that the extreme hardship that the outbreak of COVID 19 is disproportionately causing for families with children, especially children of color. We are going to hear what we can do about it. Most importantly, from Israel Glenn, a Children's Defense Fund Beat the Odds scholar, who will discuss his activism and what is at stake for young people in our current climate. A few logistics before we get started. This webinar is being recorded and all materials, including slides and handouts, will be sent to everyone who RSVP'd. Materials will also be available on the US Child Poverty Action Group website and childpovertyus.org under the webinars tab in the next few days. All attendees are muted. Um, we will be taking questions at the end, which can be typed into the Q&A box in your toolbar. Feel free to submit your questions as you think of them and indicate if you want to direct your question to a particular presenter. Earlier today, I circulated a couple of handouts to everyone who RSVP'd, including one that details some of the data you will hear discussed. There are additional resources attached in your toolbar, and we will be circulating all of these resources and even more after the webinar. And finally, we encourage you to tweet about what you're hearing today using the hashtag #EndChildPoverty. So now on to our esteemed panel. Um, we have Loy Azalea, who is the Senior Research Fellow at the Children's Defense Fund. We have Israel Glenn, who is a first-generation college student at the College of St. Scholastica in Duluth, Minnesota, who is studying law and communications. He is a student activist and very involved in his community. He was also the recipient of the Children's Defense Fund Minnesota Beat the Odds Scholarship Award in 2019. Monica Gonzalez is the Associate Director of Government Relations at Share Strength, and Myra Jones-Taylor is the Chief Policy Officer at Sierra to Three. So to start us off, I want to pose each of our presenters with this question. Is there a particular event or experience from your past that shapes the way that you approach your work? Um, and Lloyd, do you wanna get us started? Yes, um, particular event is really coming to the US in the early 90s and experiencing that, uh, the immigrant experience, particularly with my family. Um, and I think coming as an asylee really shaped the way I see things and then living um in majority community of, you know uh communities of color um black communities and coming out of poverty and being here today and being able to do the work i do is really what has shaped me doing this work today great thank you israel what about you um yeah i think um being a part of like the child care system and just seeing like things with my own eyes and living through things has shaped me into the person I am today. Like I think like experiencing and like witnessing with like with my own eyes has like been like a huge part of my development as a person. And it has gave me the strength and like 
the passion I am and what I have for this now for today. So like it has developed me over time. Okay, Monica. Oh, I think you might be on the Sorry about that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Thanks. First, thank you for inviting me to be a panelist. I think for me is that, you know, I grew up with, um, you know, humble beginnings. And I think having to work full time and go to full school full time, you know, to get a college And also having been a beneficiary of um, free and reduced price meals as a kid. So I think the ability for people to thrive going forward. Thank you. And Myra? Uh, similarly, I think um, I think I realized as um, when I was in college that I grew up either um, for a lot of my childhood poor or close to poverty. And I, when I realized the um, social fabric that was put in place, the safety net that was put in place that allowed my family to do okay, and then realizing in the late 90s just how much of that um, fabric had been eroded and was um, really being quickly unraveled by um, poor policies um, really has has put me in the place where I am today where I, I fight every day to make sure that we have durable policies so that um, families can thrive in this country. Thank you. Thank you everyone for sharing. Um, okay, so we're going to get started with kind of the, the meat of our discussion. Um, and so Lloyd, do you want to kick us off and kind of help us delve into the data and you know, we had data released last week, right, on child poverty um, in 2019, and we also know we have many indicators, right, that are showing the impact of COVID-19 for children and families. So can you kind of walk us through that and, um, you know, what are some of the strengths and weaknesses uh, and what, what we should know about it? Yes. You could go ahead and I'll I'll get the slideshow started in just a minute. All right. So hi everybody. Um I'm before I get started, I really wanna uh hope I am sending everybody some really good vibes. I'm hoping everybody's staying well, healthy, and safe. Um today, so I will be talking about um uh COVID-19, the, the census release data, as well as what implications um that we could expect from it. Um so the title, I'm just going to wait a little bit for the slide so I could give you guys more context. Okay. There we go. Sorry about that. No problem. All right. All right, so the title of my presentation today is The Good, the Bad, the Ugly, and the Way Forward. So I'm just gonna briefly run through these um, the, these data points and implications and what that means for our poorest children in America. Next slide. So let's start with the good, right? So I put good-ish because, you know, depending on where you uh, fall in, the, in, in your perspective, a lot of these points I'm gonna make are neg can be negatively impacting, uh, you know, uh, Americans' children and the poorest families. But relatively, the data collection, right, gives us a general idea of socioeconomic realities, okay? And as well as, you know, it determines, a lot of the census data determines, um, you know, public programs and services, right? And so census data also has the potential to positively impact in, um, state and local government funding. And for me, um, this last bullet is the most important part. Census data also has the, the ability to, to impact and, and really advocate for more community engagement. And I think that community engagement is at the core of any society and is so important to, to, the, to the thriving and progression of society in general. Next slide. So let's get to the numbers before we get to the bad and the ugly parts of this. 
So here we have a, a slide that shows just the numbers of the highest child poverty rates. And so in the blue box, you see that states with the highest child poverty rates in 2019, and the green box is just the numbers of the highest states with um, the, the states with the highest number of child poverty. We did in this, um, as we were um, cleaning our data, we did actually include Puerto Rico for many reasons. Of course, uh, one of them being that, you know, the, the looming potential statehood of Puerto Rico to come. But apart from Puerto Rico having 56.8% um, of uh, ch children living in poverty, we have Mississippi, Louisiana, New Mexico, Arkansas, Kentucky, Alabama. So you will notice that a lot of the, the states with the highest child poverty rates are situated in the South, and that is not by mistake. That's just where the mostly um, the socioeconomic distressed communities actually do live, right? So now, in the green box, you do have, you see that Texas, California, Florida, New York have the highest numbers of child poverty, with Texas having 1.4 million, California 1.3, Florida 700, New York 700. Of course, this is proportionate to also to the size of the state and the population. And so in that orange box right here on the bottom, just a few more stats so we just have more context of what is really happening with children in poverty and their families in 20, well, this with this time during 2019 right so more than one in three black children under six were poor in 24 states the district of columbia and puerto rico more than one in four hispanic children were poor in 22 states and puerto rico more than one in three american indian alaska native children were poor in 16 states next slide please So here I just put together a chart so we could just actually do a visual comparative analysis of the percent of poor children in 2018 and 2019. 2019 is in the in the blue lines as well as 2018 is in the orange line. So generally throughout the states, and it goes from highest to, to lowest, um, to, to highest to lowest poverty rates, you will see that Puerto Rico is actually pretty high, of course, um, with 56%. But generally we do see there was um, a, a general decline in poverty in 2019 as opposed to 2018. Okay, next slide. All right, let's get to the bad. All right, so what are the pitfalls of census data in COVID-19? Um, you know, if, if you follow anything about the census data, a lot of controversy has been around it for ages, right? But one of the main reasons um, a lot of people and a lot of agencies have contention with the census data is that the sample sizes are not representative of the population. So a lot of times there, there's generalizations being made about poverty in the U.S. and the sample sizes often are smaller, right? But generally, because of the census data, we're able to collect just to get a, an idea, a, a little bit of understanding of what is happening on the ground, okay? As Kara did mention, um, the poverty measure, measurements fall short. So OPM and SPM, right? So a lot of times what we're what we're finding is that these poverty measurements do not humanize lived experiences. They don't talk about what the everyday needs, the socioeconomic needs are of people and their families, right? So again, we have this idea of accessibility. Um, rural um, people and communities in the rural South have often uh, times have a, a hard time being accessible to actually get their data and their, their information collected, you know, census also has a lot of times low participation. Right now, I believe that for self-reported as of yesterday is about 66% of self-reported and 29% for um, uh, census field workers, um, uh, census takers actually going in. And then that gives us about like a 95% enumeration total, right? And so the most important thing, especially right now with COVID being what it is, um, Census is not in real time. Census doesn't account, the data does not account for what is happening right now in, in as we are in a pandemic, a global pandemic crisis. It doesn't speak to the realities. It doesn't speak to the shifts. It doesn't speak to how many families are have lost their jobs and how many children have been impacted, right? And then also the census data collection is costly, extremely costly. And we know that because of um, government funding um, ebbing and flowing often, uh, it does impact how uh, technologies and privacy concerns are administered through census data. And lastly, COVID-19, if at all we had some uh, progress, right? And I put progress in uh, asterisks because again, depending on where you are, but we know that COVID completely reversed any type of progress that was made for uh, 2019 into 2020. Next slide. So here is the ugly, right? So implications of COVID-19 on children and families. So at the very center of the racial inequities 
of, uh, of, of the racial inequities and disparities that do impact the poorest and most impact of vulnerable communities is structural and systemic, systemic racism and discrimination, okay? And because of this race, uh, racism and, and structural racism, sy systemic racism, what has happened is that these communities of color, particularly b black and brown, lack confidence in the government, lack confidence in these agencies and these structures to support them and help them you know, uh, make ends meet, right? At the same time, a lot of these communities also feel as though that there is no relevance for the census. They don't, there's not a complete understanding. There's a disconnect between policy and practice where the communities understand that a lot of this census data actually impacts social service and the public services as well, right? So because of that, because of that, um, so we have this, uh, a lot of children, particularly the most poorest children and in the most poorest families, right? We have increased levels of stress levels for children and families, right? This completely negatively impacts development and overall wellness because of the continued instability and insecurity that these families face because of their socioeconomic status and their, uh, and their lived experiences. It just puts more weight and toxic stress that has already been compounded, right? Particularly with COVID-19 and, and the uncertainty of what's going on in the world, you know? And so it just really puts on more pressure, already a, a very much a pressure cooker has been happening for decades and centuries uh, on top of what is going on now. And then lastly here we have, it's just going to the, the, um, the, the ugly part of this is that <laughs> the worst part of it is that it's gonna continue and worsen conditions for black, Latino, American Indian, AAPI children. So then now this brings us to the household post survey data. I, I am hopeful for this. And of course, it's a experimental um, survey that the, that the census released in the beginning of the pandemic to really gauge how many, how many families have been struggling, how many people have lost their jobs, and the experiences of what's happening on a, on a more real time level um, that we haven't seen in a long time, right? So from the house, uh, household po uh, pulse survey data, this is what we gathered, right? 51%, and this is from the, I believe the August data sets. So 51% of households with children lost employment. 22% of adults with children in households fell behind on rent. 14% of children not getting enough to eat. And 1.3 million children living in poverty do not have consistent internet access for school. And we could also um, imagine and assume right, without not even having to know all this data, is that it's going to continue to increase and the demands and the pressure on the families is only gonna just be completely more enormous than what we have today. Next slide, please. So the way forward, and this is how I really feel in my opinion, and of course, my colleagues on the call today will go more deeply and in depth in these issues, but the way forward, in my opinion, is through support, communities, participation, and innovation. So what does that really mean, right? So it means increased investment in black and brown communities. It means that this investment needs to be more, more emphasized within historically oppressed and marginalized people, right? It also means increased funding, support, and restructuring of public service programs, because we know a lot of these programs are dependent on census data, right? But because of, uh, of poor policies and, and, and really poor systems, a lot of these public services do not meet the needs at all present day for any of the, the poorest families and the poorest kids, right? So, but it also means what I think is really, really important, increased support to community-based organizations and groups on the ground, right? That engage communities more regularly and interact with communities more regularly as well. Because through this, these community organizations and agencies that are on these calls today, we, do, we are able to really see on the ground of what people are dealing with, what people are going through, as opposed to just sitting behind and doing policy work. So community-based organizations are a very, very fundamental part in what if, if we want to restructure and make better lives for the America's most vulnerable people. And then secondly, I mean, the lastly, I'm sorry, the household post survey data is a really good start. I really do believe it's a good start. Hopefully that, uh, hopefully in the future, it will increase and get better as time goes on. But apart from that, we need more innovation. We need more technological and statistical innovation that speaks to more time sensitive and culturally responsive measurements. Because we, we already know that the poverty thresholds do not speak to the reality of the demands of what everyday Americans and people are going through and what they need, right? Especially now as COVID-19 hit. COVID-19 has completely dismantled any idea and especially has just expose more gaps in wealth and income and gender in all aspects, right? And who suffers the most are children of color mainly, but also the poorest children and poorest families in America. And next slide. 
Thank you. And that's all I have to share. And I can't wait to be in conversation with you all later on. Great. Thank you so much, Eloy. Um, next, uh, we are going to watch a little video um, to hear some of Israel's story and then hear from more from him about um, all of his work in activism. The video is so powerful, Israel. Thanks so much for, for sharing it and for sharing your story. And so, you know, we want to hear more about some of your work in activism and, you know, and what drives you. Um, I just want to say thank you for allowing me to get the opportunity to share my story. And I'm so happy and honored to be here. Um, um, I am just motivated and like I'm in my video I am passionate about child like poverty and like I just like I just want to, I want to be able to help as many people as I can and if that if it takes me to share my story and you know to speak up for the people who don't get the opportunity to speak for themselves that's why I like doing things like this and I I'm just I'm just going to keep on fighting until I can't anymore honestly um yeah like honestly 
do you want to, um, I know you were involved, right, uh, about getting a question um, posed in the presidential primary debates, right, around child poverty. Do you want to speak any more to that? Yes. So um, last August, I got the opportunity from the Children's Defense Fund. They've given me so many opportunities and changed my life for the better since high school. And I'm honored to still be working with them. But um, last August, I got the opportunity to create a petition and get it signed, like draw attention, draw attention to the uh, presidential debates and um, get the question asked, like, what are we going to do for our children? When when are we going to help our children? Like this is important and this is a fight we need to fight. This isn't something we need to push to the side. And over summer, I had petitions, I had people respond to it. And I wanna say in October or November, the question got asked at the debate and it had been 20 years before the question had been asked. So the last time it was asked it was 20 years ago. So I was really happy to achieve that and just like have it like my position mentioned in the New York Times article and just like, that small thing was a big thing, you know, even like, like, I didn't even care that I like was, I, I, I was just happy that the question got asked. And with that, that just like, that's just like one of the things I've been doing over time. And I've been, I've just been working on how to get, how to get people involved in their communities, how to get us on the same page. Cause um, the children are the future, like we are the future. My generation and the generation behind me and the more food to come are the futures. We are the people that are gonna inherit the earth and hopefully make it a better place. And that's why I am really big on voting and that's why I'm really big on policy and stuff like that. And um, like I'm going to college for law and communications. And so I can use what I learned to educate people and help people as much as I can. Um, as like we, you guys were mentioning earlier, like COVID has affected the youth and people in my community back in North Minneapolis. Like this summer was crazy. The world was like literally burning. And like, it's like, it's so much going on. And like COVID was just the icing on the cake. And just to go back home from college in the summer to see like our community struggling so bad, no resources, kids getting like having to leave school and not having food at home I know that like when I was in high school and elementary those meals that breakfast lunch and snack was a big part of my day like going home you know like I mentioned in my video not knowing what I'm going to eat tonight sleeping in parks sleeping in cars school was my safe place and the policies they had in place to protect students like me and make sure we get them like to provide and resources we need was a really big deal and which is why policy is so important and being in college and the stimulus care package just like seeing that and how it didn't include children in my age group was like really hurting because it was like almost like this feels like you know like they don't care and it's just like like if, if we are the youth and we are the people that are supposed to inherit earth and make it a better place we need your support we need as much as help as we can. And I think it's really important that we, if there is a next stimulus check care package, it is important that we include age group is age groups from 16 to 24, because it's just like, we're all human and we all need support. No matter if we say we don't, we do need it. And just like housing and resources and like as someone who has been on the street, who's been homeless, I know that like housing and just like knowing that like, when COVID hit and like all of like the landlords and stuff like that, like push months rent back or pause rent. And then like, like they paused it. And then like three months later, rent is due. And it's like, if I didn't have the money three months ago, what makes you think I have it now? And just seeing so many people be pushed out on the street and homeless. And we need, I just, we need policies to reassure that this doesn't happen. We need to be prepared for things like this. And I don't know, COVID has affected the youth and affected me dramatically. And like I said, and, and this is why it is important to vote. And yeah, I just think that like everything I've been through and everything I'm trying to work for, I am trying to like build, I'm trying to build a forest, you know? I can be like a social worker and help one tree, but I wanna be like 
a Supreme Court or like a judge in help a force. Like as much as I want to, I'm 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 really trying to impact as much as possible. And I just I feel like I'm on the right path, honestly. And like I said, I am thank you for allowing me to share my story, allowing me to help. And I just wanna once again, voting is important, believe it or not. Your voice matters, voice equals vision. Thank you. Thank you for that. I think you're definitely on the right path. Um, and and give inspiration to all of us um, and to other young people. And it's all of our job to do right, right, by young people such as yourself. So thank you. And this is National Voter Registration Day, right? So this is a timely discussion and we certainly encourage everyone to, to go out and vote. So thank you and look forward to um, to getting to chat with you more, right, in the, in the question and answer. Um, yeah. So thanks again for sharing your story. Um, if anyone had trouble watching the video, I know we got a few messages. We will be make sure to circulate it afterwards. Um, there's a link up on YouTube, so um, so don't worry. There'll be other chances to get to to watch it. So um, great. Well, okay. So thanks, Monica. So um, we heard Israel talk a little bit, right, about food insecurity and, and hunger that we know were at really high levels even before the pandemic, right? And then unfortunately, um, the problem has only been exacerbated. So you know, what is, you know, some points that we should take away from recent census data, USDA data, um, and, you know, what does hunger really mean for, for kids in the short and long term? So, um, thank you for having me on board. And um, I just, first, before I dive into that a little bit, I just want to commend Israel for his courage in sharing his story with us. And I have no doubt that he's on to bigger and better th things and will certainly realize all of his dreams. And um, he's just a great reminder um, as to why we do this work, um, because we know that um, kids like Israel deserve the opportunity to realize their full potential and all of their aspirations. So um, he's a hard act to follow, um, but thank you for having me on. And again, um, my full admiration to Israel for sharing his, his really powerful story. Um, with that, I, I like to start with a little bit of gratitude here because again, just kind of as Israel underscored just how important school meals are. Um, I want to go back to your, your opening question, Kara, and um, underscore everything you said as well as what Loy said, and that is that um, all the gains that we have made, um, that we have seen in census data about, you know, progress in 2019 around food insecurity, um, we all know that they have been erased by COVID-19. Um, and I think what COVID-19 has revealed is that it's a really delicate balance between um, parents having employment, um, the type of employment opportunities out there, um, the legacy of structural and systemic racism that has also impeded the ability for um, communities of color to be able to um, achieve greater income equality. Um, so what we're seeing right now is just really this collision of all of these factors and we're seeing the impacts and for us we're really seeing it as it relates to child hunger. So next slide. Let me give you an overview of what we're seeing as it relates to food insecurity during COVID-19. Again, I want to underscore that, you know, we saw a great, great progress in 2019. And sadly, so much of that has really been erased. Um, you know, today, and and I'm going to, I'm going to give the caveat that both you and Loy said is that we probably know that these data points are already outdated. And that's unfortunate. Um, we know that one in six adults um, are food insecure. And we know that one in five parents um, with children remain food insecure. Um, we know that Black and Latino households have the greatest um, impact and hardship um, with their children having higher rates of food insecurity. 
Um, and we also know that more than 14 to 17 million children are currently food insecure. And so for listeners who are not familiar with the definition of food insecurity, this means that one or more person in the household is going to bed without enough food. Either they have skipped a meal, they have um, reduced the portion size, or um, they're really stretching in a way that it's really losing its nutritional value to provide all of the appropriate nutrition that a child needs to grow up healthy and strong. We also know that with everything that has been done, because I really want to tip my hat to all of those hunger heroes who've been out on the front line since March, um, helping to make sure that kids get meals, we still know that kids are missing meals. We still know that kids are unable to come to school. Their parents are unable to go to school and pick up meals. Um, and so we're really concerned that there still remains a gap. Um, but it is not to take away from the great work that has been done by a lot of these hunger heroes on the front line. Next slide. So, you know, delivering school meals during COVID-19 has really been incredible. Um, I think, you know, we're all familiar with people showing up, kids lining up in cafeterias, getting counted and claimed um, for their free or reduced price meals. Um, that's not what's happening today. So imagine that you're trying to deliver meals um, with a new delivery model that really ensures the safe delivery of meals um, to families during COVID-19. That means that it's not business as usual, that we have to um, identify grab and go type um, type meals. Um, and as we all know, in the very beginning of this pandemic, there was a disruption to the food system. We knew that certain um, foods were not available available to us just as regular consumers, but imagine trying to feed um, millions of kids and having to have meals um, in a way that would include a pack of carrots or sliced apples or all of those um, types of food products that all of a sudden became more scarce. But, you know, the biggest challenges and the barriers are what really prevent kids from accessing meals. So if you're in a hot spot and your parent or someone in the family um, has contracted COVID, the likelihood of you leaving that house to go pick up meals is fairly slim. Um, we also know that so many of the families, Black and Latino families, um, just a number of low-income families, um, those parents are actually essential workers or frontline workers. They're working jobs that um, required them to be in attendance and having to make the difficult decision between staying at home with your children or going to work. Um, so if a parent is going to work, it's really very difficult for them to go pick up a meal at school um, once a week, twice a week. It made it very challenging. But at the same time, we want to make sure and give a nod to those community partners. They have really stepped in to fill the gap to help feed kids. And so how is all of this able to happen? We're able to make this happen through very critical child nutrition waivers um, that are issued by the USDA. Um, so they have really allowed for critical flexibilities that have allowed for this delivery model of grab and go, that have allowed community partners to set up hubs to help the most vulnerable children and communities show up, get meals, have access to Wi-Fi. Without these waivers, all of these approaches are unable to go forward. And so it's important to note and underscore that the waivers have only been extended through December 31st, not the entire school year, but December 31st. So this kind of, um, you know, go by the seat of your pants is really not helpful or sustainable for school 
schools and community partners who are have, helping to feed children during this time. Next slide, please. So let me talk a little bit about what we're doing, how we're trying to work to make sure that kids continue to have access through this pandemic. First, we know that there are some authorities that USDA has that will sunset September 30th. Um, this is really troubling and it's got us all kind of scrambling because if these authorities are not extended, it will be very hard um, to extend these current waivers that we're working under through the entire school year. Um, we've been urging and asking child nutrition um, that the child nutrition waivers are extended before the 30th, um, but we're not hopeful that that will be done. We're also working and urging literally at this very minute that Congress extend waivers, um, extend the authority of USDA and the continuing resolution um, that we're all hearing about right now. Um, at the same time, Congressman Davis has introduced a bill with um, Congressman Jim Costa called Operation Feed Our Kids Act. Um, that is designated to help extend USDA authority. And then finally, we know that the federal nutrition programs through WIC, through school meals, and then also through SNAP. All of these programs combined ensure that kids have a healthy start and that they're able to eat whether they're at school or at home or wherever they are learning. And so as part of our overall federal priorities, we're trying to make sure that USDA authorities are extended. We're trying to make sure that there is funding in the school nutrition budgets to make sure that they have access. Um, we're trying to extend and expand pandemic EBT and also um, not listed here, but we're trying to increase the SNAP benefit um, by $25 per person per month. Um, on average, the SNAP benefit really is about $1.40 per person per meal. So I don't know how many of you have been to Starbucks, but you can't even buy a cup of coffee for $1.40. So imagine trying to live off of that kind of benefit um, or using that to really supplement um, your entire grocery bill. So we're really looking to make sure that we can ensure that we don't have um, the rate of food insecurity that we currently have, that we're working to try to curb that. We know that we will not be successful in bringing it to the 2019 levels, but we also want to make sure that we're not allowing it to be alarmingly high, that we find a way to make sure that kids are not going hungry. And I think Israel said it best, right? Kids are really hurting during COVID-19. I think we have to see the intersection of all of these factors together to recognize that kids really are hurting and we should do everything possible to make sure that we try to mitigate the impact on children so that they can thrive and remain healthy during this national health crisis. So thank you very much and really appreciate the opportunity to talk about child hunger. Thank you, Monica. Thanks so much for sharing. Okay, next we're going to hear from Meyer Jones Taylor at zero to three um, about you know child poverty when it comes to very young children um, and the childcare crisis right that we're we're seeing as a result of the pandemic. So um, you know what is some of the data telling us? You know what do we know? What what can we do about it? Thanks, Kara. First of all, thank you for having me today. Uh, zero to three is so proud to be a coalition partner in the. Uh, uh, Child Poverty Action Group, and it's really uh, honor an honor to be part of this panel. And Israel, you give me great hope. Um, we always worry about the fact that babies and young children are the age group most likely to be poor in America. 
Um, the timing of poverty matters. And for young children, it literally gets under the skin, altering critical systems and even affecting brain growth in some cases. And so the recent poverty numbers that we were just talking about tell us that under normal circumstances, we might have had cause to celebrate. Um, the fact that only, only, right, 15.4% um, of children under three were poor in 2019, which is down um, from 17.8% in 2018. So we might have been celebrating. However, we know uh, that this is not the full story that we're living in now, right? Very different circumstances. And it's incredibly frustrating to see that we were making some gains in poverty prior to COVID. And the fact that so many families were knocked off their feet so quickly in the pandemic shows just how fragile the situation of babies and families is and just how frayed that social safety net uh, that so many families rely on is was already before the pandemic. We really need to have, as I said earlier, durable policy solutions going forward if families are to recover and, this, and if this nation is to recover. And so while the pre-COVID numbers show signs of improvement, um, we also know that there are pronounced racial disparities that I, I have to address here. We know that poverty among black infants and toddlers dropped by seven percentage points, um, but it still affects more than a quarter of them. They are three times more likely to be poor as white infants and toddlers, 28% compared to 9%. And Latinx infants and toddlers were more than twice as likely to be poor as white children. So 22% versus 9% again. And finally, I want to note that when we do get the numbers next year, the 2020 poverty picture may be somewhat muddled. During COVID-19, researchers forecasted a 7% um, increase in child poverty, but we know that the CARES Act actually um, staved off a lot of the, that poverty that we were afraid of seeing. And of course, we know now that that has expired and we're seeing a significant uptick. So we are going to really have to be savvy um, and presenting the nuance of these numbers next year. Next slide, please. Oh, that, sorry, I should have, next slide from there. Sorry about that. So what we see in COVID-19 and the numbers is complex. Um, the families where many babies were already facing challenges are found. Those with low wage jobs, families of color, were the ones hit particularly hard by the pandemic and the economic uh, aftershocks that came along with it. We know that they're facing material hardship, but this was true before the pandemic and has only been exacerbated. We're fortunate that we have several data sources that are telling us in real time how families with children are doing, particularly the household pulse survey from the census and the rapid EC survey, which comes out of the University of Oregon, which canvasses uh, families with young children every week. But unfortunately, this information is telling us that families with children have experienced and are still experiencing significant material hardships. A major reason is the expiration of the CARES Act, which I talked about a little, a little bit ago, which supports that sustained uh, so many of people, so many people in the first few months of the pandemic, and those supports are now, of course, gone for now. When we look at all households with children at the end of August, over 30% um, expected to lose income in the next four weeks. 38% said it was some, so they were somewhat or um, definitely having uh, difficulty paying for household expenses. And half of households with children in this country have experienced loss of, an empo of employment um, since mid-March. Uh, in August, the proportion of households with young children anticipating difficulty paying for basic needs in that month was currently over 40% double the rate when CARES was in effect. So again, thinking about the importance of these, these swift acts um, that we're waiting on Congress um, to provide more relief, right? About three in five care, uh, caregivers within specific groups, so Black and Latinx households, single parent households, and lower income households are worried about basic shelter and food for their families. In addition, fully one third of non-low income households are now reporting financial difficulties. So we know that the kids are not all right. Next slide, please. So what are the material needs that are, aren't being met? A critical need is housing, which is the center of stability for baby's development. We worry particularly about young children because we know from the State of Babies Yearbook 2020, um, which Zero to Three just released a couple of months ago, that one in six babies already were living in crowded housing, and even more in Latinx and Black families. 
And sure enough, families with children are more likely to be uncertain if they can pay the next month's rent. So this is just creating more and more uncertainty and, and instability. Over 20% of households with children were currently behind on rent um, and 23% of households with children had little or no confidence in their ability to make next month's rent payment. And at the time of the survey, 47% of renters thought there was a good possibility they would face eviction in the next few months. The CDC's eviction moratorium may have improved that, but at some point without rental assistance, that back rent will come due and we really worry about what that will mean for families. And a third thing we worry about is food insecurity. Uh, we know, and we heard about this just before from Monica, but before the pandemic, 16% of households with babies were food insecure. And based on studies during the pandemic, we believe that rate may have more than doubled. And two weeks after the CARES Act expired, nearly 40% of caregivers of young children were worried that they would not have enough food for their families in the next month. And at the end of August, the Household Pulse Survey showed that disparities persist in families that know hunger, that already know hunger, right? So Black households with children report not having enough to eat in the past week at twice the rate of white households. And while Latinx families um, were 50% more likely to report hunger. Next slide, please. And this brings me to another area severely affected by the pandemic, and that's families' mental health. One of the reasons we worry so much about food insecurity, aside from the obvious hardship of families and children knowing hunger, is that it is the number one predictor of emotional distress among caregivers with young children. This means that these high rates of difficulty in paying for food and meeting other material needs, problems precipitated by loss of income, are detrimental to caregiver well-being, which in turn contribute to emotional and behavioral difficulties among young children. And we call this the hardship chain reaction. And so we are really worried that Congress, if they don't move quickly to address these very real hardships, the pandemic will be indelibly imprinted on young children's development. Next slide, please. We also know that babies absorb the stress of adults around them amid traumatic situations like this pandemic. And this chart here, developed using data from the Rapid EC study that I mentioned earlier, shows how emotional distress grows as financial difficulties increase and how distress in young children closely tracks that of their caregivers, right? It's that feedback loop, it's that chain reaction as mentioned. The blue columns represent caregiver stress while the yellow columns represent their children. Next slide, please. And so we've had a crisis within a crisis. We've heard a lot in the press about childcare and early learning. And this is a critical service for families that is essential to the economy getting back on track. And the childcare system has been on the brink of collapse, hanging on by a thread for years. Um, and now the absence of federal support in the midst of this crisis is really making it so that we worry that 50% of all childcare programs in this country may not be able to come back, uh, may, may close their doors and not be able to come back. And we are seeing many well-established programs closing their doors for good. While many programs may be open now, they simply cannot make the finances work. And so we, like I said, we really worry about how many will actually be open once this pandemic is over. And that's a problem for families who need this care, right? Almost three quarters of families with low income are looking for care. And those are the families where two of five babies are found and they can't find anything that they can afford. And so I don't know how people think we're gonna have this economy get back on track if we don't address the childcare crisis. Next slide, please. And this brings me to policy needs. Even as we struggle to get families the help they continue to need to weather the pandemic as it rolls on, we know we need durable policy solutions for the future. Nothing could be more clear than what the pandemic has done, has laid bare. The health, social, and economic crisis that precipitated would have been much easier to address if we had built the strong systems for families in recognition of their needs before the pandemic hit. And so to build for the future, we need to make sure we have childcare that is fully in place. We need a $50 billion investment right now to shore up and sustain this critical part of our system. We need support for Head Start and Early Head Start to meet pandemic needs now and for the future. We need to make sure that children are having well visits and vaccinations during the pandemic. 
And we also need to make sure that we have federal pandemic unemployment and direct payment support. Of course, paid leave and medical leave are critical. They were critical before and the, the pandemic has made it clear just how much we need those now. And we also need emergency prevention services to reach isolated families who we worry are being completely left out of the system. Next slide, please. So finally, on a final note, I wanna talk about the census. Many of the programs that support early development depend on the census for allocating funds. And the, the census is critical to determining the need for, for and distributing critical resources that support all domains of early development. And I know we're running on time here, but this is absolutely critical. We have a very short window of time to make sure all babies are counted. We know that in 2010, about 2.2 million children under five were missed. That means almost one out of every 10 young children were uncounted. And so another major undercount would be catastrophic and truly detrimental for so many families and, and well-being in this country. And I will leave it there in the interest of time. Thank you so much, Myra, for that. Um, and I'll mention, I know um, many of our organizations are involved in the Count All Kids Committee, right, which is working really hard to make sure that there is not an undercount of children in the census the way there was the last time. Um, and so I encourage folks to visit countallkids.org as ways that you could get involved. Um, we have a short amount of time left. Hopefully we'll have more. Um, to make sure all kids are counted in the census, um, and we'll include that link in the chat as well. Um, um, so before we get to questions, I just want to briefly add to the remarks um, that we've heard and um, further discuss the importance of providing families with cash assistance during this time um, and into the future. So we've heard a little bit already from some of our presenters about the importance of providing um, cash during this time. So. The positive impact of boosting family income through cash assistance for children is well established. Um, the National Academy of Sciences put out a landmark study on child poverty last year that found that when families receive cash transfers, it results in positive long-term implications for a child's healthy development, meaning they grow up to be physically healthier, do better in school, and earn more as adults. This is because additional and steady income allows parents and guardians to provide additional resources for their children and relieve some of the stress of where a family's next meal is going to come from or how to pay rent. So we know it's really critical that Congress provide ongoing cash assistance to families of children to both mitigate the impact of COVID-19 as to well as um, to address our consistently high level of child poverty that existed even before the pandemic. So we first urge Congress to strengthen the child tax credit and convert it into a monthly child allowance as proposed in the American Family Act, which is both in the House and Senate and has large numbers of support. Um, research from Columbia University Center on Poverty and Social Policy finds that one third of children, including 50% of Black and Hispanic children, are not able to receive the full annual 2000 child tax credit because their families earn too little to meet the phase in um, required for the full amount. And the National Academy of Sciences study that I mentioned earlier, Roadmap to Reducing Child Poverty, found that a 250 monthly child allowance, which is about $3,000 annually per child, would do more than any other policy in reducing child poverty. There was a provision in the HEROES Act, which was passed by the House of Representatives in May um, to address the impact of COVID that would increase the child tax credit for 2021. Um, and Vice President Biden just included a similar provision in his tax plan that he released last week. Um, so for more information on um, expanding the child tax credit, First Focus, the Children's Defense Fund, and other members of the Children's Advocacy Community sent a letter to Congress um, that we will include a link to the chat and also will circulate afterwards. Um, we also have a resource page on kind of, you know, research and tools around the child tax credit. Um, again, we will share that link um, and we will also um, circulate afterwards. Um, and in addition, we urge Congress to provide households with emergency cash assistance um, as proposed in the Pandemic TANF Assistance Act. Um, this will provide extra help for families to weather the crisis, um, to weather this crisis and meet their basic needs including families and um, families and children of color who are being hit hardest by the pandemic and who are more likely to live in states where access to benefits is already limited. This fund would be particularly helpful to those families who have been unable or ineligible to receive unemployment insurance or stimulus payments, um, such as immigrant families or grandparents caring for grandchildren. 
And it's important to note that despite the name of the bill, these funds would actually not run directly through the Temporary Assistance for Needy Families or the TANF program. Um, and so the Children's Defense Fund, First Focus, and the Coalition on Human Needs co-led a letter that was signed by um, 170 organizations around the country, earning Congress to pass the Pandemic TANF Assistance Act and implement a $10 billion emergency assistance grant program. Um, and again, we will include a link to the letter in our chat, which also has um, the bill number for the Pandemic TANF Assistance Act um, for more information. Um, and so finally, I know Myra touched upon this, um, it's critical that Congress pass at least $100 billion in emergency rental assistance to help the 30 to 40 million people at risk of eviction. Um, and this assistance must prioritize children and families experiencing homelessness or at risk of homelessness. While the eviction moratorium recently implemented by the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention is a step, um, without rental assistance, people will accumulate back rent arrears and then once again be at risk of eviction um, at the end of the year when the moratorium is lifted. It's also likely this moratorium will not cover homeless families who are living in hotel or motel rooms or who are living doubled up. So it's really critical that these families are able to access rental assistance. Um, and in addition, the moratorium requires tenants to sign a declaration with a series of questions confirming that they qualify um, for protection from eviction. And so therefore, in order for the moratorium to be effective, we also need additional funding for civil legal services so people can access legal advice on how to fill out this declaration and so they could be notified, right, that this declaration, um, that this moratorium may protect them from eviction at least through um, the end of the year as of now. Um, so thank you again to all of our presenters. Um, and now I, know, I wanna turn over and make sure we have some time for Q&A from the audience. Um, we've gotten a lot of questions so far, which is great. If we don't get to your question um, and you would still like it to be answered, um, you can feel free to email me Cara, C as in cat, A-R-A, B as in boy, at firstfocus.org after the webinar. Um, and I can follow up with one of our great presenters um, to get you an answer. And we also just put that um, in the chat. So actually, um, I want to give the first question um, over to Israel. Um, and, you know, in Israel, and you can feel free to either hop back on camera or just talk uh, via audio. But, you know, do you have any... Well, first of all, we got a question um, that, you know, some people might not be aware, right, of the question that was asked um, around child poverty. And so, you know, there was a question due to so much of your work and the work of others um, at Children's Defense Fund and around the country uh, to, you know, to ask the candidates about what they would do, right, on child poverty if they became president. And that was asked at the New Hampshire primary debate. Um, and I'll, we could try to circulate a, a clip of it afterwards. Um, like you said, it hadn't been asked in 20 years. So thank you to, for all that work. And so do you have, um, you had a kind of one piece of advice for young people. I know you mentioned vote, right, which is really great. And so that is certainly number one. Um, but say to young people who can't vote, right, or do you have any additional um, piece of advice for young people like yourself, right, um, and ways they could, they could get involved and, and channel their passion the way you have? Um, I would say it's all about asking questions. The most important thing you can do is like to ask the person in charge in questions. Like if that means like going up to your community community organizer and asking them questions about how can I help? Is the correct information going to spread throughout the community? How can I use my voice in the most successful way? Even if it's just talking to people in your community, that is a big deal. Um, one of the biggest things I struggle with is feeling like my voice didn't matter and like just knowing that like, just by me sharing my story, it has, I've been able to participate in all this and, you know, have my story all on YouTube and stuff like that. This is like a big deal. And it shows this, this all started from me asking a question in high school about like, I don't know, like how can I help my community? It started from one question. So don't be afraid to ask a question. Don't be afraid to get support, don't be afraid to get involved. You don't have to be on the front lines of the war or like be on the front lines. Sometimes it's the most important people who are in the back, the people you don't see every day who are doing the most work. So just get out there, ask questions. If you're a shy person, like I said, I am a shy person, but I'm also kind of loud. So like, I don't know, just make, sh just make sure that you feel like that you're, you are being heard. Cause like, like I said, it's like, 
once you get that first sensation of like, oh, wow, people care and people are listening to me, it's only up from here, honestly. Thank you. Thank you for that. And I want you to know that, um, I don't know if you've gotten to see them, but we'll send them to you afterwards, that you've gotten a lot of great messages um, thanking you for sharing your story and, and confirming that you are on the right path um, and that you're going to continue to do great things. So thank you again. Um, the next question, which I think could be for any of our panelists, um, would be, what would it take to create the political will for Congress to invest more in programs serving children and families and for them to address the systemic racism in our societal systems? Um, we know that's one of the main barriers, right, to making progress. Um, and so uh, does anyone want to um, take that on? Yeah, I would like to start with saying in order to ask Congress to invest more and to address the systemic racism, we also have to change the narratives about who is poor, about um, why um, there is a need for this um, assistance and support because, and we also have to change the imagery around that. I think we have to have more representation of um, people like Israel that shows that we need to invest in the future, we need to invest in change, and that the only way we're going to overcome poverty and that we're going to make a difference is, is if we invest in the future, and that that future is very hopeful and positive. I think the biggest challenge I have as a lobbyist is trying to overcome, um, you know, solidified and um, really established narratives that are really myths. Um, you know, they're not they're not an accurate portrayal or representation. And I think what COVID-19 has done is it has opened the door and shown that so many people are subject to poverty, um, that they're one paycheck away. And that, you know, because COVID has really impacted so many people who were we perceived to be doing well and are currently not, um, that the face of hunger and poverty could really be your next door neighbor. So I think in order for us to be able to get more investment and to do more is we also have to address the narratives that um, surround um, people and children who live in poverty. Yeah, I agree. And, and I would add, I think, you know, I really agree, Monica, with the changing of the narrative. And I think um, a few things to go deeper there. I think one is we have this um, myth, as you said, in this country that, you know, we, we really do care about children and that we are, um, you know, children are our future, all of the things, all the tropes that we use. But if you look at policy, if you look at data, you see how what an absolute falsehood that is. It isn't actually a lie that we tell ourselves as a nation. Right. And so I think truly reframing the conversation around how we talk about children, um, that it has to be our shared prosperity as a nation um, in communities is about our shared um, support of one another. And I know that sounds so cliche, but we there really has to be um, a critical, completely reframing and calling out, frankly, the myths that we tell ourselves about um, children, how we how we support children in this country. And, and finally, I think one thing we, we have to be able to do, and this is a challenge to all of uh, you know my colleagues in the child advocacy space, is be a little bit bolder and, and not so, um, and really not play it so safe. I think people assume that child advocacy organizations, because we serve children, we focus on children, that we are going to um, pull our punches a little bit. We're not going to be kind of in your face. Um, but children need us to be in the faces of policymakers and really um, kind of take the gloves off. And I think um, be a little bit more daring when it comes to how we, how we fight, truly fight um, for children in this country. And I just, wanted, I just wanted to quickly add, I think um, uh, generally there's a selective amnesia, a historical selective amnesia that happens. And we often want to fast forward um, as opposed to really looking at what has happened, right? Because when we're talking about structural racism, um, like I said earlier in the presentation and, and everybody on the call, 
um, really uh, mentioned, it, this is at the center. It impacts literally everything because racism pulled apart impacts how we view one another. How do we view people? How do we view these children? And again, like Monica and Myra said, you know, this, this demystifying of narratives, right? Changing this narrative and humanizing these experiences. There's not a lot of humanization happening with what is happening. Anybody could be in poverty, but we do know that poverty right now impacts more black and brown um, children, you know? And I think that's one thing that I really enjoy listening to uh, young people like Israel, because what's happening now with the protests, right? There's a lot of pressure. Continued applied pressure will only move forward because what happens to bubbles? They pop they're not sustainable, right? They pop, then we have to continue to restructure and reimagine what we want our future to be. Yeah, and, and I think the other piece of that is that when you do look at some of these policies that really are intended to exclude people from, you know, the, the programs and the assistance, whether it's, you know, drug testing, um, if you're a beneficiary of welfare of the welfare program or whether you are an immigrant child who is in a mixed status family that sometimes these policies are really designed to exclude you not to help you so we have to really dismantle that and really address and get back to um, again saying not necessarily who deserves this but why we really need to invest in children and why we really need to make sure that we're enacting policies that are about lifting up people, not excluding them. Absolutely. Um, and we have kind of a political question here for you, Monica. Um, would you suggest that uh -oh. we do a last minute push to get these nutrition provisions that you mentioned, right, such as extension of pen, um, PEBT, uh, included in the CR um, and any kind of update you want to give on on that? Absolutely. I, I can I can never say enough that you need to call your representatives or to do a push to say that pandemic EBT and and these waivers need to be extended. And just for people to understand what pandemic EBT, it is the value of a free or reduced priced meal that is on an EBT card that allows parents to go to the grocery store to pick and choose food the same way I do for my child um, and to be able to feed them in the event that they're not able to access school meals. So that is really the a safe and efficient way to feed children. And it is complementary to school meals. It's not in place of school meals. It is complementary to school meals. So absolutely. Okay, great. Um, and I think we have time for one more question. Um, I think this one is is um, best for you, Meyer. It says, the federal government provided financial support to states to address childcare needs. Are there good examples of states that have successfully invested these funds to support the childcare system? Oh, now you caught me off guard. I don't, I cannot speak um, to a specific state off the top of my head. I apologize. And now I'm thinking about my team thinking, oh man, failing them. Um, but we do know a few things that are really important to make sure that you, that states are keeping in mind when it comes to um, using these relief funds. And that is um, that we make sure that we are not rolling back the regulations and the safety measures that we have put in place and we have fought so hard um, to achieve in this country for, for children. So I've heard um, talk of, of people saying, well, you know, the, if we're worried about, you know, there being a childcare um, desert, then let's just change the ratios so that you can have one child or, you know, one caregiver for every six babies or, or you know, whatever, fill in the blank. That is, um, fundamentally the wrong direction and something we cannot allow this crisis um, to have us move backward. And so when I think about what states need to be doing, it's making sure that we are using this opportunity to go forward um, and to not change regulations back to, you know, jeopardize children's safety. And we, we truly need to be thinking about how this can become a public good, that childcare um, is can no longer be seen as this market-driven um, part of our economy. Children 
need a uh, an enriching a nurturing and a safe place to go while their parents work 60 percent or um, babies right now more than 60 percent uh, have all available parents uh, working in the workforce you know post pre-covid um, so this is not a luxury we need to make sure that for the, the vast majority of children who are in the care of others and their parents that they have a safe and nurturing place to go and we have to completely change the way we fund the system and it needs to be built in to our public um, funding system and the way we think about k-12 education great thank you um okay well i think we're up against the time thank you so much to all of our presenters um thank you again israel for sharing your story um i know we didn't get to all the questions in the chat um, I'm seeing some of them and we'll try to follow up with some, but also again, you can feel free to email me. My email's in the chat um, and I'm happy to follow up with the presenters. Um, we will be sharing the recording, slides, and handouts um, that we mentioned afterwards to everyone who RSVP'd. Again, they will also be up on nchildpovertyus.org under our webinars tab um, within the next few days. So thank you again all for taking the time um, out of your day and for providing us um, with some important information and a little inspiration, which is much needed during this time. I hope everyone has a great rest of their afternoon. Thank you. Thank you so much.